back to Left Bench Sports. We'll be talking about the Dolphins loss, the Eagles, the Giants defeat of the Commanders, college football, and the MLB championship. The Dolphins just suffered their second loss against the Eagles. Yeah, each team's O-line struggled, uh, giving up seven total sacks together. But um, as a, I told I think the uh, Dolphins O-line was much worse, though. I mean, Tua threw his just one touchdown this game, so it's not, you know, his normal game usually. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, he also threw a pick to Darius Slay. As Slay, uh, he continues to be elite for the Eagles at cornerback. Yeah, Darius Slay is just, he's becoming a lot better of a player, and he's working really good with the Eagles, and they just found what works great for him, and he's going to keep, you know, moving on and improving and getting better. He's definitely an elite player at this time right now. Yeah, and for the Dolphins, uh, Tyreek had a pretty quiet game for his standards. You know, for anyone else, 11 receptions, uh, 88 yards is a solid game. But when we're talking Tyreek Hill, the guy was averaging like 120 yards a game. Yeah, for Tyreek Hill, he's literally one of the best wide receivers, if not the best in the NFL. And a game like this for him is just, you know, it's not near his average standards, which are, as you said, 120 yards a game and a lot more to expect from him. This is one of his lower games in the last few games he's had. However, he did receive uh, the only touchdown pass that Tua threw. It was a, a great long throw. The Dolphins' defense had their struggles giving up over 300 total yards against the Eagles this game. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, they have they had two injured cornerbacks. Uh, uh, Jalen Ramsey is still going to take uh, some more time. And then uh, out this week was uh, Xavier Howard. So it was obviously not easy to defend guys like Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown, who had a great game. They also continued to struggle against tight ends as they were the worst team in the league defending them. Yeah, they gave up. They have given up the most yards to tight ends out of any team in the NFL. So definitely need to patch something up there. And uh, the tight end they gave up the yardage to this week was the Eagles' Dallas Goddard. Uh, 77 yards, pretty solid for a tight end. Yeah, it's good for a tight end. Goddard's a great player. I yep. mean, he's one of the better tight ends in the league but also the Dolphins this week they played a much better team than they normally have gotten yeah the Eagles are definitely one of the top elite teams right now in the league uh Dolphins are up there but Eagles they seem to show their dominance over them this week Hertz had a pretty solid week uh thrown for the Eagles completion percentage is 74 percent but uh he's thrown more picks this year than he's thrown all than he threw all of last year I mean, so. listen to improved. You gotta, you know, build off the mistakes you make, and some new, some old. Is he still top five? Um, I disagree with that. To be honest, I mean, I don't think uh, Jalen Hurts is a top five QB right now. Yeah, definitely not. No. And uh, but AJ Brown had an outstanding game: ten catches, hundred thirty-seven yards. So AJ Brown, another good player, solid right now. He's doing great and improving as the weeks have come on, and he's got a lot more to show. Yeah. As we mentioned, Goddard was a great against. Uh, against this tight end and in vulnerable defense. Yep. And uh, Josh Sweat was definitely the brightest spot of the uh, Eagles D-line D line, uh, with uh, two sacks. Two of the four sacks this game against the Dolphins were from uh, the D-line, and they were from him. So half that's from him. Props to him. Yeah. Uh, is this a sign that the Dolphins could be frauds? No, the Dolphins are not frauds. I mean, I don't know about that. That'll do it for this week's Dolphins coverage. Don't go anywhere. Jesse will be talking about the Giants' second win of the year. Welcome back to Left Bench Sports. This week we're going to be uh, shifting our focus from the Jets, and we're going to be moving on to the Giants. So let's get right into it. This week uh, Danny Jones was riding the pine, and Tyrod Taylor took his place. Did really well. With uh, He went 18 for 29 on completed passes and had 279 passing yards with no less than two touchdowns and zero picks to show for it. Uh, Overall, a really good game played by the Giants, uh, probably one of their best ones of the season. You know, Commanders couldn't really play up to par with them, even though the game was pretty close. Uh, And it really came down to about six yards, and it would have been a 14-apiece game. Um, And the Giants really came in clutch, too, with that big fourth down stop there. Um, And in the final two minutes... Uh, the game, they really just hammered the nails into the coffin with the commanders. Plain and simple, like I said before, it was a well-played game uh, from both sides. Taylor just outplayed Howell, and uh, I I think what this game really proved was that the whole blame game for, you know, 
why the Giants have been playing poorly in the past couple of weeks has really been narrowed down after this game. Um, you know, recently the fans have been going back and forth saying, oh, you know, it's the offensive line, and then others say Jones. And now I think the people who say Jones, though, might be right because, I mean, Taylor was without three of his starting offen- offensive line this week. And, um, you know, he, he really played pretty exceptional. Um, and, you know, by default, obviously, a QB is going to struggle. Uh, but Taylor was really able to adapt, which tells me that he might be more fit for the QB spot than um, Daniel Jones is. Because, uh, you know, Taylor, I mean, obviously did really well. But it, it's going to take a few more games for me to see um, with Taylor at the starting spot. Like I said with um, Zach Wilson at the start of the season, it's going to take a few games for me to be fully convinced that he's more capable than Jones, a QB. I mean, Washington's not really a great team, never really have been. So um, that's that. And I guess the other problem with is I have with Jones being on the bench is that he's a little over 20% of their salary cap. And as everyone knows, the $40 million is no small sum of money. And, you know, it would really just go to waste if he was sitting on the bench for the rest of the season. So, I mean, the front office for the Giants really has some tough decisions to make here. But like I said, I think uh, if you give Taylor a little bit more playing time, um, convince me, myself, and the fan base that he has what it takes to bring this team back up from 2-5, and five, back up to a winning record, and most importantly, take us back to the playoffs. Uh, so that's all for me this week. And next up, we have Jake and Smitty with their weekly discussion on college football and more all after this. Hello, and welcome back to another college football coverage on Left Bench Sports. Uh, welcome back, Smitty. Uh, the first game we had on Saturday was Ohio State versus Penn State. Coming into the game, uh, Ohio State was definitely the favorite, ranked third in the nation. Um, they've won the last six games versus Penn State. So a big matchup in the in the Big Ten, but Smitty, who was your take for winner? Um, I thought Ohio State was going to win. Like even though like they're two good teams, I still thought Ohio State was going to win. Yeah, two at the start. Yeah, two great teams, but I think everyone really had Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Six straight years of Ohio State winning, and they made it seven. So the game was low scoring most of the time, but it was a pretty good performance from both the defenses. I mean, kept it a low score. The Penn State offense struggled. But, uh, Ohio State's defense just completely shut him down. Drew Aller mm-hmm. couldn't do anything. Mm-mm. He was like, he just didn't have a game like how he usually does. Only 18 out of 42 passes um, completed and only 191 passing yards and one TD that was pretty late in the game. Like, it was like, he just didn't have a good game like how he usually does. Yeah, his completion percentage was under 50%. So not much looking on offense for Penn State. I mean, they haven't. If you think about who they played so far, they haven't played like a really good team yet. But Ohio State's definitely the first good team they played, mm-hmm. and they have Michigan later in the year. So not too much of an action-packed game, but the key factor was definitely the defense. All right, so moving on to the next game, we had Tennessee versus Alabama. This time, a hyped-up matchup in the SEC. Uh, Alabama came looking for revenge from last year. And they definitely got it. They won 34-20. to 20. Smitty, who did you think was going to win this game? Um, to be honest, I thought Tennessee was going to win for the second year in a row. Uh, they're just te- – they're both two good teams this year. Both well-ranked, well – good offense, good defense. But I still thought Tennessee was going to win at the start. Yeah, me too. Just because – I don't know. I think a lot of people would agree too. Alabama looks like – a little bit like worse than yeah. they usually are. It's not like it's like how they used to be ranked, like number one or number no, two. Yeah. They're back they're back to like eleven this year. Like they're back to the top ten. They're not even the or the top fifteen. They're not in the top ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tennessee started off strong with a twenty seven lead going into half. And I think like we were all thinking that like Alabama isn't the same as they used to be. But did you think they would have been able to make a comeback at halftime? Mm, probably not the way like they they were playing well it was just that I didn't think that they had the like the power or the strength to come back and after the half to win it all yeah, the way they were looking I didn't think it would happen but they came they came out good in the second half and 
They started with a 46-yard touchdown pass to Isaiah Bond uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. And 20 unanswered points. And then to top it off, to make it 27 unanswered points, Jihad Campbell with a fumble recovery. Yeah. Tennessee's defense in the second half was just brutal. It wasn't gr it wasn't good. It was like they're just it wasn't th their defense that they've been playing all season. Yeah, they just completely collapsed and then Alabama, you know, they were starting to look like how they usually look. Mm -hmm. Jalen Milrow starting to prove himself. So yep. no Tennessee scoring at all in the second half and 27 unanswered points. Yep. Uh Alabama's now ranked ninth. but Smitty, here's the big question. Do you think they have a chance at the playoffs? Uh, I still think they still have a chance at the playoff. They're they're a good team. It's not like they're like out of the running. It's just like they're just not as good as they used to be in the past years. Yeah, I think they I think they have a chance. Um, I feel like they're getting better every week. Like in the beginning, they looked a little shaky. But they were, yeah, they were a little slow. Like how you said, shaky. They were just they didn't get to a start where they should have gotten to a start. They should have started winning games in the beginning. But now now they're starting to win the games. But it's just they're close games. Yeah, I think so. Their remaining opponents are LSU, Kentucky, Chattanooga, and Auburn. But the most important game is definitely the next one versus LSU. But they need to have a big game. Yeah, all those, all those four games are all winnable games. Yeah, like, like especially LSU. LSU would be a big win for them, and then Kentucky, Chattanooga, and Auburn. Those are just three winnable games for them. Yeah, three winnable games. Kentucky and Auburn, definitely decent teams, but LSU is definitely the big one. And if they get them out and win out the rest of the season, then I think they have a chance at the playoff. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to our last game, we had a few good ones we wanted to choose from, like Duke FSU or Utah versus USC. But we decided to go with UNC versus Virginia because it was just a huge upset this game. The previously ranked number 10 UNC got upset by Virginia, who was 1-5 coming into this game. Shocks all around. Uh, Smitty, I'm not even going to ask who you thought was going to win. Just, like, what are your thoughts about the game? My thoughts about the game is just that it's a disgrace that the that UNC is losing to an unranked team when they're ranked number 10th in the country. Not even unranked. Like, 1-5. in five. Yeah. They've been getting destroyed by everything they played, um, especially with the way they've been playing. Like They've been playing really well. Yeah, it's just surprising. So the game started off back and forth. Virginia led 14-7 at the end of the first, and then in the second quarter, Drake May threw a long touchdown, tied up, but going into the halftime, so close, it was 17-14 USC, UNC, and then uh, third quarter, you know, here's when we thought, like, you know, UNC is going to show who they usually are. Drake May had a touchdown run to make it a 10-point game, but, like, as soon as you think that, Virginia ties it with the field goal, and then they get a touchdown in the third, and we're like, Wow, they're they're still in it. Like, how is Virginia still competing with UNC? Yeah, but um, it was just it was just not a good second half. Also, again for UNC, like UNC, like they should have just blown out Virginia in the in the beginning. Like it shouldn't have been that close at halftime. Yeah, a team like that, they just gotta just get them over with. Um, they just couldn't close out drives. I think their problem was. Mm -hmm. But definitely a crazy game. Virginia players were celebrating like crazy. Yeah. And Virginia moves up to only 2-5 and five while North Carolina gets pushed back to number 17. Yeah. Well, that's it for another great week of college football. Stay tuned for more coverage next week. And next up, we got Miles, Luke, Miles and Luke talking about the MLB playoffs. Hello, welcome back to Left Bench Sports. I'm Miles Berkowitz, and this is Luke Jacklin. Now we'll be switching sports and giving a World Series preview. First representing the American League, the Texas Rangers finished the season with 90-72 and and entered the playoffs as a wildcard team. They were the streakiest team in the league this season, in my opinion, getting off to a fast start and then faltering as the season went on. Most of that, I think, can be attributed to their weak bullpen, as they didn't really make any moves at the deadline. All they really brought in was Raldis Chapman, who wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really that great. But uh, they made some good moves in the starting rotation, adding Jordan Montgomery and Max Scherzer. I mean, I think those also were great moves. Uh, Scherzer and J-Mo started uh, multiple games in the series, and uh, I think they had a good good trade deadline. But their offense is really what carried them this series with Adolis Garcia. Uh, he had a great series. He was obviously very motivated uh, <laughs> going into the series. But uh, Corey Seager struggled throughout the series. Games one through six, he only batted 182 
but then in game seven he finally broke through and had three hits and started the started the game off with a homer. Luke, who is your key player going into this World Series? Going into the World Series, I think it has to be Adolis Garcia right now. The way he ended that hit, like series against the Astros after getting hit by a pitch by Brian Abreu, he was the hottest hitter in that series. He had three home runs in the last final two games that they had to win to go to the World Series. And Diamondbacks pitching is good, but he can figure them out and keep hitting. And this Texas Rangers offense is going to be really good. Hard to beat. As you were saying, their pitching has to step up. Uh, Montgomery's been good, and Evaldi's good. But more than that, they're going to need Scherzer to be better. I just don't know what if he has anything left to still pitch on. But if he's good, then they'll they could get those three starters being good. Then they'll have a great series. Yeah, I mean, he was just, like, hitting unconscious, especially in Game 7. He was locked in. Um, he took a lot of bad swings in Game 6. He was 0 for 4 with three strikeouts. But in Game 7, he really shortened his swing, and then he started hitting. Then he had two home runs, and here we are going in the World Series. Well, for me, the key for the range, for the Rangers is Evan Carter. Um, he was in Double A just a month ago, if you could believe that. But uh, he's just really amazing. Um, he's so patient at a young age. He's only, like, 20 something but Bruce Bochy called him a a, a comparison was Juan Soto because he's just so patient in the box uh he had like a ton of full count pitches uh in the minor and major leagues I think he's just really great and I think because they slide him into the three hole a lot now he's just going to be even better um he's after Seager another lefty that they can use and I think he's just really a great player and he's in my opinion the key to the Rangers yeah I mean the top four in their order Simeon Seager and then Carter and then Garcia and all four of those guys are great hitters so they could all like hit really well and carry this Rangers team and coming out of the National League or the Diamondbacks underdogs in every series they did, like barely even made it to the playoffs with an 86 and 76 record in the regular season but somehow they're here, and they're led by probable like rookie of the year Corbin Carroll, and he's been by far the best player on the team this year. Even though he didn't have a great NLCS, he's still pretty good. And he went three for four, two stolen bases, and two runs in Game Seven to get them like through that game and get them to the World Series. And they got a very young, very young lineup with other guys like Alec Thomas and uh, Gabriel Moreno, who they got acquired from Toronto last year. Uh, and they're really led by their pitchers. Like Zach Gallen, they have fought who pitched last night to get them to the World Series. And, yeah, their pitchers led them. And then that young lineup can score enough runs to win games. Yeah, I mean, watching them, it's like, you know, you know what you're going to get with them. You're going to get great defense. You're going to get good pitching, and you're going to get an offense that just does enough to win games. But the key to – uh, the series for me, for the Diamondbacks at least, is Christian Walker. He had a terrible championship series. He batted like, I don't even know what he batted, under 200. But in the regular season, he was great. He had 33 home runs, 123 RBI, and 123 OPS+. plus. But as I said, he struggled in the championship series. But he, I think if he can turn it around batting at the three hole, he's just amazing. And they can go with the top three of... Carroll, Pham, and Walker, and I think that's really going to set him up, set him up well for the Rangers pitching. Yeah, and their other guy, could tell Marte, who's probably the best hitter in the NLCS. He hit 387 and had a hit in every playoff game, and he hit in different spots of the order. Some nights he's in leadoff, he's hit two and three, and he's just he he just hits. Regular season, he had 25 home runs and 82 RBIs. His switch hitter also really helps their lineup. And uh, I don't know, he was just probably their best hitter overall. Yeah, last night when he hits from the right side, he has more power, but when he hits from the left side, I think he has a lot more contact. So whether they throw out Montgomery against him or Evaldi even, I think it's just going to be a really good matchup for Marte, and he's so hot right now. Him and Garcia, the two hottest hitters for both teams, it's going to be a great matchup. All right, Luke. What's your prediction for the series? I think the I think the Rangers are going to win, but it's going to be seven games. I think, I think it's going to be that uh, Rangers lineup versus Diamondbacks pitching the whole way, and I think the Rangers are going to get it in seven. In my opinion, I think it's the Diamondbacks. I think they're the team of destiny this year. Um, they're like the 2021 Braves. You don't really know how they're winning, but they just keep on winning. I think they're pitching. 
Uh, they have shown me their big question was pitching depth, but now with the emergence of Fott and Merrill Kelly pitching well, I think their bullpen's going to do just enough to get them through, so I got uh, Diamondbacks in six. Okay, thank you for watching as we will see you next week on Left Bench Sports.